Welcome to the Holistic Psychiatry Podcast. I'm Courtney Snyder, a physician and holistic adult and child psychiatrist. In this episode, I'll be talking all about zinc, a nutrient that I think is incredibly important when it comes to our health, especially our mental health. It's also a big player when it comes to our immune system and our gastrointestinal system. Both of these systems play a big role in our mental health, and it's a big player when it comes to COVID, especially in preventing illness and chronic complications. To me, it's amazing how little zinc is talked about. In my daily work treating people with brain-related symptoms, zinc is one of the most powerful tools that I have. That's because more than 90% of people diagnosed with depression, behavioral disorders, ADHD, autism, and schizophrenia have relatively low zinc levels, ranging from low normal to severely deficient. In this episode, I'll talk about why lower zinc levels are associated with psychiatric conditions and the many ways that low zinc levels impact brain functioning. Low zinc levels also raise the risk of physical conditions such as autoimmune conditions, infertility, cancer, and it appears to raise the likelihood of getting COVID, being sick from COVID, and having chronic neuropsychiatric symptoms from COVID. I'll discuss how we measure zinc and why the typical lab ranges aren't necessarily the optimal ranges. And lastly, I'll talk about how I address zinc deficiency in my practice. So what is zinc exactly? It is considered a trace metal or an essential element. It is not a heavy metal. Heavy metals include things like mercury, lead, aluminum, cadmium, and these are toxic and should not be in the body. However, trace metals should be there, and these include things like copper, iron, lithium, chromium, nickel, cobalt, molybdenum, manganese, and again, zinc. We have about 2 to 3 grams of zinc in our body, making it the second most abundant trace element in the human body after iron. Zinc is essential to all forms of life. It's present in a number of proteins that play a key role in how our cells divide and in the expression of our genes. It is a component of more than 200 enzymes in the body. And remember that enzymes are really what makes things happen in the body. So zinc is needed for normal growth and development from the time we're being formed all the way through adolescence. In the brain specifically, zinc is involved in the regulation of neurogenesis. So neurogenesis is the formation of neurons. And zinc is involved in neuronal migration and differentiation. So basically in how nerves grow into uh, unique neuronal pathways. And we need this to happen for our brain development, so our cognitive development, and it's why zinc deficiency is so prevalent in autism. We also need neurogenesis to be occurring for the sake of neuroplasticity. And this is our brain's ability to rewire itself during our lives. And this is constantly going on. It's important to note that zinc is necessary in preventing neurodegeneration. So things like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and age-related macular degeneration. Zinc is an important antioxidant helping address free radicals that can contribute to cell death. And this is something I talked about in the podcast on toxicity. And zinc is essential for the overall functioning of our immune system. There are many ways that zinc is involved that go beyond the scope of this podcast. Along with proteins called metallothionines, zinc is a key component of the blood-brain barrier, so it keeps harmful chemicals and toxins out of the brain. It's important for the integrity of the gut-blood barrier, so it prevents toxins and microbes and particular food particles from getting into the bloodstream. 
And it's important in another barrier, that being our skin, and is important in wound healing. It does have a collagen-stimulating effect, which would be particularly relevant for those listening who fall on the hypermobility spectrum, people who are particularly flexible, all the way to those who may have Ehlers-Danlos. There is evidence, again, that it is important not only in the prevention of COVID, but in decreasing the severity of symptoms and protecting the brain from long-term consequences, mostly, again, due to its role in the immune system and its antiviral effects. And because COVID can be neurotoxic and because zinc is very protective of the brain, it's helpful there as well. So how do we get zinc? I'll talk about why, for many of us, zinc from food is not enough to put us in the optimal range, and why, for many, supplementation becomes important. Zinc in food, however, can be found in red meat, seafood, oysters, or actually especially high, uh, legumes, so beans and grains, and chicken, And know that zinc from plants, so beans and grains, is less likely to be absorbed because of phytates in plants that bind zinc and inhibit its absorption. So this becomes very important for those who are on a vegetarian or plant-based diet. This could create problems and result in, again, zinc deficiency and consequences of that. A vegetarian diet can easily increase someone's vulnerability to mental health conditions, inflammation, and toxicity. This is also an important point for those with or those working with individuals with anorexia who may become more rigid in their thinking and thus more restricted in their eating, in part because they are increasingly low in zinc, and I would add low in methyl. And that relates to undermethylation, and methyl we also get from protein sources. I think in these modern times when the food we eat is less nutrient-dense and the environment that we live in is more toxic, the more we're exposed to toxins, the more antioxidants, including zinc, can become depleted. And then we can become deficient and have the secondary issues, which I'll be talking about. So it's important as we talk about zinc deficiency to consider that adequate intake of zinc is required to maintain a steady state because zinc does not have a specialized storage system within the body. According to the World Health Organization, zinc deficiency affects one-third of the world's population. It represents the fifth leading cause of death and illness in developing countries. There are a number of causes of deficiency And again, when I'm talking about mental health, that can be relatively low zinc, so low but still in what's considered a normal range, or severely deficient. So as I'm talking about the one-third of the world's population, that's referring to more of a severe deficiency. The causes of zinc deficiency The most important would be malnutrition, and this affects 17% of the world population. Gastrointestinal diseases such as Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, and pancreatic disease can contribute to zinc deficiency. Uh, Severe or chronic forms of diarrhea can contribute to zinc deficiency, as can increased oxidative stress, which I was talking about. Again, this is where there's an excess of free radicals, and this could be from illness, from infection, from inflammation. So really any chronic illness can contribute to zinc deficiency over time. So chronic liver disease, chronic renal disease, sickle cell disease, diabetes, malignancy, and other chronic illnesses. Aging can contribute, and it's very common and expected that as we age, we will become more deficient in zinc. So the need for supplementation becomes that much more important. And also, as I mentioned, to protect our brain as we age. Decreased absorption can be from a number of causes, including alcohol-related disorders, So alcohol decreases the intestinal absorption of zinc 
and it increases the amount of zinc leaving the body through urine. Certain medications can decrease the absorption, including steroids. Certain antibiotics, such as quinolone antibiotics, and one example would be Cipro, and tetracycline antibiotics. Certain diuretics can also inhibit the absorption of zinc. And high doses of iron, greater than 25 milligrams, could interfere with the absorption of zinc. And so in this case, it would be important to take the iron away from the zinc so that they're not interfering with one another. Less known causes, but very relevant when it comes to brain-related conditions, would be genetic factors that could contribute to deficiency, as well as high pyroles. I've done a podcast on elevated pyroles. And basically, pyroles are a metabolic waste product that leave the body through the urine, and they can take zinc and B6 with them. This disruption in zinc regulation can further increase the urinary excretion of zinc. So normally, 5% is lost in the urine, but with pyroles, uh, this is increased. The effects of deficiency have been known since the 1960s, And I'll start with the physical symptoms that were first observed and then move into uh, what is known and being learned about brain-related symptoms. So originally it was recognized that growth retardation, loss of appetite, and impaired immune function were effects caused by uh, deficiency in zinc. And again, this has been since the 1960s. More severe symptoms can include hair loss, delayed sexual maturation, impotence, uh, lack of development of the testes in males, eye and skin lesions, weight loss, delayed healing of wounds, taste abnormalities, seizures, mental lethargy, and learning problems. Though there is ample research on the association of low zinc with autism, depression, and dementia, part of what I'll be talking about comes from the pioneering work of Dr. William Walsh and the Walsh Research Institute, where they studied the nutrient levels in over 30,000 people with brain-related symptoms and found that there were only a few imbalances that consistently showed up. I speak about this in previous podcasts, one referencing Dr. William Walsh in the title, as well as one on copper overload and pyrrole disorder. So those high incidence nutrient and chemical imbalances were zinc deficiency being the most frequently observed imbalance, copper overload, pyrrole disorder, oxidative overload, methylation disorder, folate deficiency or overload, and fatty acid metabolism. So this is why almost everyone that I see needs zinc as part of their treatment protocol. The incidence of zinc depletion, I'll list for the following populations. For autism, it was found to be in 98% of individuals. Antisocial personality disorder, 95%. Violent behavior, 78%. Alzheimer's, 72%. ADHD, 68%. Bipolar disorder, 52%, schizophrenia, 45%, and clinical depression, 32%. So the relationship relates to the impact that zinc has on neurotransmitter functioning. So on those chemicals that allow cells to, nerve cells to communicate with one another. So with low zinc can come copper overload because zinc is one of the things that keeps copper in check. And when someone has copper overload, they will have low dopamine and high norepinephrine. And so this can look like ADHD. There can be problems with attention and focus and then also high adrenaline states. We might see sleep problems and anxiety and depression. With low zinc, someone can also have impaired NMDA activity. Now, the NMDA receptor is a big player when it comes to brain health, and there's endless research that's being done and learned about this receptor. 
Zinc has a role in the activation and inhibition of the NMDA receptor, again, which is important for mental health. Zinc is needed to convert B6 to PLP, which is needed for the synthesis of serotonin, dopamine, GABA, and other neurotransmitters. It's important in the regulation of GABA, which is a calming neurotransmitter, and zinc itself is considered actually a neurotransmitter. If someone is low in zinc, they will also have limited expression of the metallothionine proteins, and these are the proteins in combination with zinc that are a key part of the blood-brain barrier. And so low zinc can contribute to a vulnerability to toxic metals and those impacts on the brain. So as far as testing, it's important first to note that 99% of zinc is inside the cells where it is bound to these chelating proteins called metallothionines. Less than 1% of zinc is actually in the plasma However, that is what we measure when we're evaluating someone's zinc status, is we measure plasma zinc. So if you ask your doctor to draw a plasma zinc level, they may be happy to do that. Sadly, though, there are not many who at this time see value in checking zinc levels. And you have to keep in mind that a doctor needs to have a reason in their mind for doing a test and an understanding of what to do with the result. So you're just wanting a zinc level. It's not a given that they're going to understand the need for that. You can order your own plasma zinc level, and ideally I would recommend if someone is doing this that they also check their copper level. A lab, DHA laboratory, uh, and this is not a, I don't have any financial relationship with this or any lab for that matter, But this is where you could order zinc level and copper level, and they actually have a brain health kind of bundle. When they share those results, you'll see the labs range, but you'll also see the optimal ranges for things like zinc and copper. And those optimal ranges are based on the work of Dr. Pfeiffer and Dr. Walsh and the Walsh Research Institute. The reason to get both the copper and the zinc is that you don't want to drive low copper down even further with zinc supplementation. So more often in brain health, what we see is high copper, not low, but it is still possible to have a low zinc level. And if someone were to take high amounts of zinc, that could cause problems in that regard. I do think that zinc levels should be part of every medical and psychiatric evaluation, not just to address things like toxicity, inflammation, and neurotransmitter functioning, but to also prevent the consequences of toxicity, inflammation, and neurotransmitter dysfunction. So I hope you have a greater appreciation of zinc And if you'd like to help me share some of this information and get it out into the world, please consider sharing or liking or commenting on any of the social media sites or on the podcasting platform if that's an available option. If you'd like to learn more about root causes of brain-related symptoms, please visit my website at CourtneySnyderMD.com. And if you'd like updates on these podcasts, please consider subscribing. I look forward to connecting with you in a future podcast. And until then, take care. Bye-bye.